Most running is, is straight plane, but you know, with, if we're talking about the athletic population after Achilles, we got to make sure that they can cut and change and, and you know put different type of forces through the Achilles. It's not just sagittal plane, strut, straight front to back. It's 45, it's 35, it's 27 degree angle of push-offs, right? Hi, everybody. Doug Adams here with Scott Greenberg from the Run DNA podcast. Excited to bring you another episode. I have had many running injuries, most, I think. This is one that I hope I never have, uh, but something that Scott is very near and dear to him and something that if you listen to some of our other episodes, he said this was his favorite thing to treat. So we're going to talk about post-operative care for Achilles ruptures. And so I hope most people don't experience this, but if you're in the physical therapy, athletic training, chiropractic space, like you're going to deal with these injuries at some point, and it's a really good idea. And I like to take a little perspective on it, even talk a little bit about some of the early phases, but I'd like to really go into even some of the running because I'm going to interview Scott a little bit more here more. Um, my bread and butter is post-op ACL. I've done some publishing and, and continue to do a lot on this, and Scott, this is really his bread and butter. So, Scott, um, you know, default to you how you want to go into it, but maybe we just start talking about like early phase when somebody comes in, let's just dive right in. What are you doing? What are the key things that you want to achieve in that first week or two of rehab when somebody comes into you? I think I think it's I think it's important and probably one of the most important things to discuss. But you also got to understand what type of Achilles repair they have. Did they have a traditional mm -hmm. open repair, which again is probably um, it's still out there, still still see it to this day. Um, it's becoming less and less. I think popular or less and less uh, the common you're seeing some of the more mini open or the percutaneous kind of um, type of type of procedures being performed where you don't have to, you know, fillet the cat, fillet the Achilles open quite as much and, and really kind of uh, it's how they tie the knots a lot of times too, is, is mm -hmm. really what makes the big difference in the, in the traditional open repair, you're getting a, a proximal and distal portion that's pulled together and then literally sutured together. Um, and you get this big bolus and, and this this knot type of repair. A lot of the repairs they're doing are, are now more um, knotless repairs where they actually go in and they actually um, suture, we'll call it um, horizontally across the tendon at the proximal and distal end, and then leave, this, leave the threads kind of hanging off the sides and actually tie the threads together from the lateral and medial side of the tendon, as opposed to actually going through the heart of the tendon and suturing through in essence, two pieces of tissue that are have exploded, for lack of a better term. Right. So I think it's a cleaner repair. I think uh, you get a lot less scarring, uh, negative scarring, we'll say. It's a lot less um, of that big, bolus, knotty kind of tissue that you've previously seen. And then there's other things that you can kind of bring into that type of repair, which is more of like the, the traditional uh, the speed bridge repair, which is like an internal bracing mm -hmm. type of procedure in which you're actually taking the proximal portion of the tendon and lopping it down and, and anchoring it into the calcaneus. So again, depending on, you know, the type of procedure you had done, um, you can be a little bit more aggressive with certain ones versus other ones, et cetera. But the most important key to rehab early on with Achilles repairs is number one, you've got to um, protect the repair and protect the wound, right? Wound closure to me is 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 paramount in this type of procedure because um and that's again one of the reasons they they started to move away from the total open procedures because again a big large incision there uh opens you up for more infections and um also um not a whole lot of skin there so if you don't get good closure initially you can open yourself up to um you know um having to go with the grafting and and it becomes a bigger a bigger mess at that point um, infection obviously is something you have to consider the, the larger the repair, also the larger the incision, the, the more likely you are to have, to have any type of, uh, infection. And that's an, again, another, another thing to really be, uh, aware of mindful of, and really try to limit at all costs if you possibly can. Um, so that would be the first part, incision closure and then protection, you know, um, really trying to avoid early on any type of hands-on, dorsiflexion type stretching. One of the things I learned at an early stage is never, ever, ever stretch the Achilles into dorsiflexion uh, passively. You know, if, if at some point somebody's not getting to neutral and they have to actively uh, do it or active assistively do it where they're in control, that's fine. 
Um, and actually, if you want to work on dorsiflexion, sometimes some active contractions at a later point into dorsiflexion is fine. Um, but you can actually gauge the amount of force um, better um, if you are the patient rather than the practitioner giving that force. So, um, so you really I have a question about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So one of the one of the things you know, similar to ACL world, uh, my understanding of Achilles is a couple key things include early weight bearing, and a lot of the reviews and the literature talks about also mobilization. So that was going to be a point I talked about it to say like I like a hands on a, a mobilization of the ankle and the foot is really important. But maybe you can clarify about that with your last point about saying you're not really stretching them into dorsiflexion. But the arthrokinematics or how the joint is moving is important as well. And you really want to make sure that early stage you're getting early weight bearing and you're getting some of that early mobilization. But that's not synonymous or you can specify this more. But my understanding is that's not synonymous with passive range of motion that's getting kinematics back right yeah i would agree with that so early early weight bearing is has been shown to again i think accelerate the healing process right you're getting more Mm -hmm. blood flow to the area that doesn't mean that you know you get them into a normal shoe right off the bat it means like you know weight bearing is tolerated in a boot earlier you know as opposed to being non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks you can get them in in a weight bearing boot for you know two weeks out with a heel lift and then start to wean that heel lift down over the next several weeks and then get them out of the boot and into a shoe with a heel lift and they're still using crutches on and off depending on where they are in that spectrum. Um, but early weight bearing is something I believe in. I think um, the research um, definitely bears out that you're no more likely to rupture the Achilles mm-hmm. by early weight bearing. Um, so, so I think that's a positive thing. And then in terms of range of motion, I think you know range of motion into inversion, eversion, and plantar flexion are obviously fine, especially if you're doing it actively at a you know say say two week mark is when I'll start yeah. some of that. You know, the first two weeks are probably in a cast or some type of splint, really making sure the wound closes. And once the wound's closed and and any type of sutures are removed and and things are kind of looking, you know, better, then you can start that that active range of motion. Um, And like you said, going after the joint is different than going after the actual tendon and soft tissue. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think I'm not opposed to going after the the joint, but I typically don't do that in the early, early stages. I will typically wait a couple of weeks before I go right after that talocrural joint. Um, and I would see, I would basically see how the patient is progressing with their own range of motion. It's kind of like one of those things. I liken it to the shoulder, right? So you have these guardrails of, of, uh, after let's say, a uh, a bank card or a slap, you know, there's some range of motion limitations, right? But if the person's getting there easy, you, you don't, there's no need to stretch them, right? You know, there's no, there's no reason, but if somebody is tight, you might want to push that range of motion a little bit earlier. And you know, like this range of motion is going to be a, a, uh, like a, a, uh, a battle with this particular patient. So you, you're not afraid to be a little bit more aggressive as opposed to that, that shoulder that's just right from the get go, real loosey goosey. You're going to protect that one a lot more. Same with the ankle. I'd say if, if somebody's getting their motion back and they get to, to neutral dorsiflexion fairly easy actively, I'm not going to worry about stretching them. I usually find that once you get them weight bearing in the shoe, that range of motion comes back fairly quick as body weight just gets pushed down through it. Yeah. So, you know, I think about like ACL and knee patients, you can pretty much always mobilize the patella with shoulder you can always work on scapular stability most of the time there's always exceptions to this right but uh, you can work on scapular stability and scapular mobility and things like that so i i've in you know i've i've a limited experience with some of these i've maybe done between a dozen and a dozen and a half of of these post-operative but i always really like doing my tail joint mobilizations early on because i do think that they like the mobility a bit there and it is almost more you're getting in that like grade one to two but i do them in seated like position where they're sitting off the edge with their knee fully bent to 90 degrees in a pendant position and i'm kind of mobilizing i'm doing the hand motion for those people listening on the podcast check out Mm -hmm. YouTube if you want to see the videos Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm kind of doing some mobilizations there and I even work like the corners a little bit and I'll work some of those things and uh, like I find that that's similar to uh, like working the knee for the patella that it's going to give them some relief with some of that stuff I'm just I tend not to do that Um, I tend to be a lot more cautious Again, one of the things, especially in the athletic population, you're going to have to worry about is, is, is tissue creep, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want an athlete to lose their, um, their, we're going to call it rigidity. 
you know, that ability to load and explode. And oftentimes, if you're too aggressive early on, even though you're going after the joint, if, especially in the position where you're talking about where the leg is dangling in the seated position and the, the ankles getting, you know, starting in a plantar flex position, moving up to 90, I, I tend to not want to put any undue stress on that tendon early on um, and really tend to just let, let the healing take over and do what it needs to do in, during those phases. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're in a plantar flex position and you want to do some, you know, some light mobilization of the, you know, some PAs and such, that's fine. But any type of mobilization with movement or any, any, any likelihood of lengthening that tendon, I really, really try not to do. Um, because I think the risk reward there doesn't bear out for me. Um, I really want to make, you know, I I think, I think, uh, and here's the other thing is a, a patient isn't going to necessarily have pain if you do it. But what they're going to notice in later stages is that they're not nearly as explosive and is not nearly as strong as they could be if you would have allowed that tissue to really kind of settle in and heal down a little bit better. Okay, so so early on here, anything else that we should really consider? Um, kind of quick takeaways that in the early phase, things you're really you know looking to incorporate or things you're really looking to avoid. So so the, so the things number one, it's wound healing. Yeah. It's early weight bearing, it's avoiding overstretching unnecessarily the tendon, and then getting that strength back as quick and as, 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 as quick as you can, right? Uh, maximizing that, that strength. Because again, the thing that holds athletes out of participation towards the end and, and really kind of is the, really the gauge as to when they get back is, is that strength symmetry, like where they are, can they do the things they need to do to protect themselves? Do they need to, can they do the things they need to do to be uh, at the performance level they need to be at? So one thing that I like to implement early on, literally day one post-op, I'll do blood flow restriction on the uninvolved side because there is a little bit of a systemic effect, right? So we know we can get some benefit there. And then literally, as soon as I start the ability to do some light ankle pumping and some light ankle circles, I'll throw the BFR on and do it while they're doing those exercises. Because again, um, yes, it's not necessarily 20% of their one rep max, but what, you know, for me, if I can create an environment that is closer to that 20 to 30% of their one rep max, as opposed to the 70, 80, plus use the BFR to really heighten that response, I'm going to do it. You know, there's, I have, I have nothing to lose in that situation and only things to gain by putting the blood flow restriction on. So I use it early on. And then literally for the, that's, this is the population I find to be probably the best suited for blood flow, blood flow restriction in the lower body, because again, Calf atrophy is one of the biggest limiting factors as to when these people get back. And if we can get them back quicker by getting them stronger quicker, I think we're getting ahead of the, uh, the eight ball there. So when do you initiate like more traditional type strengthening or what's your, what's your progression? Like when do you start the strengthening? When, what do you do? Do you do full range? Do you do limited range? Obviously we're not going into dorsiflexion like those things, but when do you start some of the strength stuff? So I think a little bit will depend on the physician you're working with, what their comfort level is, right? So I think somewhere between probably around three to four weeks out, I'll usually start mm-hmm. some some TheraBand resisted, light TheraBand resisted inversion, eversion, and and um, dorsiflexion um, yeah. to neutral. And even if they go a little bit beyond neutral actively, I don't think that the force that they're generating is going to be problematic. But usually I hold them to neutral um, into dorsiflexion. And then we usually wait about two weeks or so, give or take, to get them into plantar flexion. Um, and then we just progress the resistance for there. Again, whether we're using, I, and again, I do bl- blood flow restriction with all this. So again, the bands that I'm using are fairly light, but at the same time, we're maximizing the effect of it. Yeah. Um, what about, you know, we're going to get later to uh, running gait, but what about walking gait? Like when can you start walking with them and what are some of the considerations um, that we're looking for? What are you typically seeing people are uh, accommodating or how are they altering their gait mechanics? Because, I mean, we talk a lot about running on here, but I think walking gait mechanics is so important early on. I use the 3D motion analysis for post-op anything really early on to be able to see it and and identify some of those barriers. So what do you see in this population? Like I said, it's a progression from, you know, weight bearing is tolerated with weight bearing is tolerated in the boot with crutches, progressing off the crutches, then slowly lowering the height of the heel lift in the, in the boot. Uh, When you're ready to get them out of the boot and into a normal shoe, again, I get them back on the crutches. I put the heel lifts back in and then about every week or so I lower it down. So somewhere between, you know, eight weeks or so, give or take, we try Mm -hmm. to get them into a normal shoe 
Um, de again, depending on how each person is individualized there a little bit, uh, but roughly speaking around eight weeks or so, we'll get them walking in a normal shoe. The things you tend to see, the limitations are the push off strength, obviously, and then mm -hmm. the ability to get into, you know, having the affected leg be the, the, the trail leg and, and, and almost like not being able to get into that dorsiflexion position quite as much. So they're kind right. of either turned out a little bit or they rise their heel a little bit quicker than they need to. Um, but again, trying to limit the stretch on the tendon is, is really important. So I'm not, I'm, I'm okay with that. If they're not able to necessarily get into full dorsiflexion at that point, strength, this, strength, strength. Yeah. And this is where it just shows you how important it is to understand biomechanics of mm -hmm. movement there, because when somebody's walking, we know that, and there's good studies, actually, I just saw some posts on this recently about how, when you go into dorsiflexion, that the most stress on the Achilles tendon isn't at push off. No. It's. It, when they're going into dorsiflexion during stance phase and mm -hmm. they're seeing that there and, and that push off during like I, I don't think a lot of people understand that push off is very limited amount of that actually goes towards forward propulsion the mm -hmm. majority of that goes towards swing limb advancement and Correct. clearance of sure. that so it's not as much like you want them to get the even step length but i think what you'll see more commonly in this population is that they might be in a stiffer position during stance phase mm -hmm. and you're almost going to see some altered mechanics on the uninvolved side accommodating for some of those changes I think that's true, but I think also what you're going to, I think I agree with that hundred percent, but what you'll also see is because they probably haven't been um, very aggressive yet with their ability to get up and down on their toes, mm -hmm. they're hesitant to, to do yeah. so during gait. So I think more so than being, uh, and if they're unable to do it, it's due to lack of strength, um, yeah. even though it maybe doesn't require nearly as much as, as but the, the, the load is, is definitely different, but the actual strength to push off. Um, is going to be affected somewhat, I think, at that at that stage. Well, I would think that this is a big reason maybe why early weight bearing is very important because we also have a lot of sensors and receptors in our foot. Agreed. And when you are in immobilization, we're going to dampen those receptors. And it might not be even, and what we're saying, and why we, we want to understand not only just range of motion of gait, but like what is the purpose of push off and what is the purpose? Because we can say, hey, they probably have enough strength to achieve the goal of push off because it's not real unless they're walking faster when you walk faster push off contributes more to forward propulsion but when you're walking at normal speeds you don't have as much contribution to forward propulsion so they probably have enough strength but they probably don't have enough awareness of what they're doing and their proprioception and their awareness of what they're doing. So when you're doing gait retraining, it might be say, hey, obviously it's gonna be an individual thing like we always say here. And if somebody's having pain or if somebody is really having a lot more weakness, that might be the, the part of it. But it really could really be like, you do need to teach them to push off in this phase because it's just, they don't know that they're not doing it. And we're looking to improve symmetry, although symmetry is up for debate sometimes with walking, but we're looking, you know, to restore normal walking mechanics as best we can. Um, so I think that's important. And it just shows like the role of biomechanics in, in any, particularly this one, but we're talking about it specifically related to Achilles, but we should know all the mechanics to say, well, you know, hey, they might be compensating. If somebody with Achilles is coming in and starts talking about their hip and their back hurting, it's probably that their their propulsion they're compensating uh, by increasing the demand on the glutes and the the knee extensors in order to get from loading response to to um, toe off and terminal stance and that's what we're seeing because they're in a stiffer position they don't want to go into dorsiflexion so yeah, you have to understand I tend to see, yeah, I tend to see yeah. more of the hip and the back pain <laughs> related more in this population to the boot wearing than anything yeah. else so yes. just because again that that boot creates that asymmetry in the in the you know, in, in the lower limb and in, in, through, in through the spine that I think that creates more problems. So once I get out of that situation, a lot of times I feel a lot better. And, yeah. uh, and, and so, so like I said, this, this group actually is, is for me is, is a really joy to work with because again, you're, you, you feel, I feel like I'm always making a difference. I feel like, um, they have very minimal pain. Um, they need us to set some, some boundaries as to what they can and can't do. Um, and then it's a matter of just, gradual progression and you can see how they improve as time goes on. It's really, really great watching, you know, just like an ACL watching a quad, right? But yeah. having somebody be able to not go up on both their toes in a seated position to all of a sudden be able to do it in a standing position to all of a sudden being able to do it single leg, 
right? So all of these things slow and steadily kind of return. And then they, you know, they learn how to hop and then they learn how to hop on yeah. two legs to one leg and how they, how high they can get. And we do a lot of testing with our athletes at, at the right time as to, you know, their counter movement jumps and their drop lands and those type of things to see, you know, what they are versus the other side or what they were pre and post injury. So all of that's really, really nice to see that progression. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we talk about conservative management of Achilles tendinopathy, right, which is very different, um, I think there's even studies showing that if you have Achilles pain, you're less likely to actually have Achilles rupture a lot of times. Like there's some studies that I've seen floating around about there. But um, there's a lot of understanding in the rehabilitative world about conservative management, and there's discussion of isometrics and heavy, slow resistance. And, you know, where... It, where does that fall in in the post-operative realm of that? And, and what, uh, because obviously it's all about promoting tendon health. So where do those two start to intersect? So first of all, when you start talking about conservative treatment for an Achilles repair, yeah. there are people that don't opt for surgery. And there are great mm -hmm. studies out there that show that um, non-operative approach in a lot of ways at 12 months is fairly equal to that of the, of the mm -hmm. surgical approach. Um, you know, in, with regards to, you know, infection rate is obviously higher in the surgical one because you're cutting yep. versus not cutting, right? Um, in terms of rupture and re-rupture rate, um, in the um, non-operative group, it's slightly higher, but not really significant. Um, strength gains are a little bit, a lot, um, uh, are, are returned a little bit quicker with the surgical yeah. group, but at a year, it kind of balances itself out. So in the right person, the right population, um, somebody that's not going to need to be explosive anymore. Um, somebody that caught it early and, and actually um, was splinted in a plantar flex position within the first 24 to 36 hours to allow that tissue to kind of heal back together a lot better. Um, the outcomes are fairly good non-operatively. So um, it's something to consider. Now, in the athletic population, you tend not to see that because, again, getting athletes back as quick as we can. Um, having that secondary restraint of that of that of that suture kind of tying it all together and ways in which we can be a little bit more aggressive early on with early weight bearing, whereas mm -hmm. with a with a non-operative approach, you're going to be a little bit more conservative early on. So all of that leads to the athletic population skewing more towards a surgical approach. But there are plenty of people that have done very, very well non-operatively. You just got to pick your patient right uh, for that. Now, all right. with regards to your What's that? I was going to say, I don't know if you dodged my question or you just no, no, went no, on no. there. No, no, no. But, yeah. so with, so with, uh, you mentioned conservative, and I think that yes, we, yes. we need to talk yeah. about that because not every Achilles repair is going down the surgical route. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, somebody that's 40, 45 years old, you know, the, the weekend warrior tennis player that tears their Achilles may or may not want to have that surgically repaired because, again, the, their life demands may not need them to be explosive moving forward and, and such. But with regards to the um, – the heavy, slow, the eccentrics, the isometrics. Um, I like to throw all of that at my athletes, depending on which one I think they tolerate the best, which one feels the best. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, isometrics work really good at pain modulation. Uh, mm -hmm. I have found, um, and, and this holds true whether you're talking about the Achilles or the or the patellar tendon for that matter. Um, I like to uh, heavy, slow resistance versus eccentric. So why would somebody go eccentric? There's not magic in eccentrics. It's just that p patients can tolerate more weight eccentrically. Mm -hmm. More weight through the tendon is thought to be better for the actual resiliency of that tendon. However, if somebody's going with heavy, slow, concentric slash eccentric, you know, full range of motion in both directions, and you're progressively bloating them over time, I think that could be equally as effective. I've had patients tolerate one more than the other in terms of their comfort level, what's more, what they enjoy more, what they don't like, what bothers them after the fact more. And it varies. I found that varies from patient to patient. So I like to incorporate um, exercises of all of that given my sessions. Obviously, I start off oftentimes with like eccentrics, uh, excuse me, with, um, with isometrics. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll try some very light, full range, concentric, eccentric and see how they do. And then we may just play with trying a phase of of, uh, of eccentric loading to see how they tolerate that. But in any given session, you may see, and if you look at my, my exercise logs, I may have components of all three of that given a different exercise um, for that given patient. So I might do single leg, single leg um, uh, weight bearing calf raises. 
um, focusing on concentric and eccentric. I might put them on the shuttle in a supine position going heavy eccentrics. And then I yeah. might get them, I might get them in another situation where maybe they're doing some um, soleus work where there's a heavy resistance where they can't move it and their knee is bent and they're trying to almost like you're doing a, a soleus um, strength test into yeah. like a dynamometer of something um, where, where you're getting some more isometric work. So I might do all of it, but I think um, um, patient tolerance for me is what, what is what I go for. Yeah, I, the thing I like about Achilles exercises, like there are a bunch of variables that you can manipulate, any exercises, right? But I think it's important to understand when you're working on calf and Achilles type loading progressions here, realizing that you can control variables like the time of contraction, right? So an isometric hold, the range of motion, I think is really important because we yeah. know that our ability to create plantar flexion force at end range plantar flexion is very limited. So if you're strengthening somebody through full range of motion, your goal is not strength with them, right? Like your goal is is taking them through and maybe it's more muscular endurance type thing. If you're truly training strength, you're going to focus more on some of the mid ranges there where, the, where it's strongest because you can lift significantly higher weights with that. So a couple so, of things to think about right there. So number one, um, when I'm doing my Achilles stuff, number one, I'm never going to start them on a step doing a calf raise. I'm always going to start them in a flat ground neutral position. So I'm not putting them into excessive dorsiflexion, right? Yep. So that's one thing you got to keep in mind whether you're doing it weight bearing or whether you're doing it on like a, a leg press machine or so make sure that they keep their ankle neutral um, mm -hmm. and not go into that extreme ranges of dorsiflexion. Again, that's not something I'm comfortable stretching up until probably, I think the studies show that the creep usually ends around the five to six month mark. So yeah. I, I'm really not pushing that all that much. Um, it usually plateaus around that time from what I understand. Um, but also, um, where was I going to go with that? Um, oh, shoot. Lost my train of thought. Um, no worries. While you're saying it, it just, it, you know, I, I think it's important that we just understand the variables that we're manipulating and really make sure that you're considering all of those things. And you could have it could look like one exercise, but you could have like three variations on it and it doesn't have to be really good. And one thing that I really like, and I think um, maybe when we talk about conservative, uh, this is another spot we'll mention again. There's a video by Karen Sibonagel and her group. Um, if you just look up a, a exercise or Achilles load per exercise on YouTube and Karin, K-A-R-I-N, Silvernagel, I'm not going to spell that. Sorry, Karin. Um, but if you just look that up, there's a great video that is showing um, just how each exercise mimics daily things. So if somebody's not able to walk, there's exercises that are less stressed on the Achilles than walking. And if somebody's not able to do stairs, there's exercises that aren't able to do stairs. And I, so there's an article, there's an article Doug, called, it was Baxter 2020, I believe. Baxter 2020 or Baxter 2021, which lists, I believe it's three stages of exercise. I see a three or four, but I think it's three stages of exercises. And yeah. In each of those stage, it shows the amount of um, basically the amount of, of stress on the um, on the Achilles tendon, and it basically walks you through all of the different activities from you know seated calf raises to standing calf raises to lunges with it being the front leg to the back leg to drop lands to jumping to single leg hop. It basically walks you through the amount of stress in each of those situations. Um, and, and, and allows for a great progression. Yeah, I, I think um, those are just good things to have. And like, you should just mm -hmm. look those kind of things up um, yeah. and make sure that you're familiar with it. I'm like getting the link right now so we can put it in the show notes here. Um, because I think that that's really important for you to be able to understand like, hey, what what type of exercise you're choosing and, and how that should impact the body there. And it just goes through a whole um, progression there. So I'll find that and we'll put yep. that in some show notes there too. Um, I, was gonna, I remember what I was going to say, Doug, I forgot the yeah. point, but, but like you were talking about, um, about strengthening through certain ranges, what I have found also really, yeah. really, like you said, it's the terminal ranges of plantar flexion, which tend to be the weakest. And oftentimes yeah. people use momentum to get them to that point during like a calf raise or such. So yeah. if I can start them with a slightly elevated heel and have them mm -hmm. raise their calf from a static elevated heel position to that end range, 
I find yeah. that really kind of weeds out. It, it separates the men from the boys, so to speak, right? So it really makes it more difficult to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's great. And then, but if you were trying to truly improve strength, you would want to start more in like the the mid ranges and make sure that you're focused on some of that too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and one of the things just for exercises, I think it's also really important. I had, uh, you know, I work with a lot of athletes and and a lot of the professionals that come and see me, I, I help them remotely. A lot of times they call me up. I got a call last night from one of my athletes like, hey, this has hurt me or that's hurt me. And it's also important that you give good cues to people to understand where they should be feeling it and make mm -hmm. sure that they understand. Like I've seen a lot of people that do calf raises, especially after Achilles issues, where they we need a little bit of inversion, right? But when somebody's going excessively inversion and they've lost complete weight bearing through the first ray at all there, mm -hmm. we'll see that. So I tend to give cues about when I'm doing exercises where they should feel it, right? And for the majority of the exercise saying, we, we want make sure that you're still feeling some weight bearing underneath of that knuckle joint under your big toe and that helps them to really understand where they should be feeling it and then all of a sudden you'll see that like the range goes down and they feel it in a different place it's like yes that's what i want so work on your cueing and make sure you're you're giving appropriate guidance on what they should be feeling while they're doing the exercises mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree um, all right, so let's jump forward a little bit here because we've already talked about a lot of good stuff. But let's jump forward to the return to running because a lot of people are uh, interested in running or runners uh, with this here. So um, tell me about some considerations, you know, some thoughts of even maybe some points to hit on treadmill versus overground. Um, are they in a heel lift to start? Or do you recommend a high heel to toe uh, drop there for some of the things? Like what are some of your considerations or tools, body weight support? Like what are some of the things that you think about when you're getting somebody back to running? Um, great question. So I think a lot of it comes back to you know, can they tolerate the ability to load and explode? I do a progression of, you know, can you hop in place on two legs? You know, mm -hmm. what does it look like on one leg? Uh, can you switch between one and the other? And like, you know, where we are in the whole spectrum of time too, right? Yeah. So I want to make sure we're, we're conscious about that. You know, at our at our facilities, we're, we're lucky to have, you know, boost um, treadmills or Alter-G treadmills to really assist me and us with those type of progressions. So that's where I'm going first with regards to my return to run program. I will get them in the gravity assisted kind of situation where they're running, you know, at a relatively slow speed, um, for, uh, you know, five minutes, let's say at 70% mm -hmm. of their body weight. Um, you know, I think, um, I tend to keep my treadmill fairly level, you know, mm -hmm. uh, again, if you, you got to be, if you bring them up into a, into an incline, you know, can their ankle tolerate that amount of dorsiflexion? Um, can you assist them a little bit by going downhill? Cause the stress on the, on the tendons a little bit less. Um, but again, depending on what their gait mechanics look like, um, I, I think you have to look at if somebody's a toe runner or a rear foot or a four foot striker, I think obviously four foot strikers are going to put more stress through the Achilles tendon than a mm -hmm. rear foot striker. But that being said, somebody that is with prolonged pronation may actually, and, and a lot of rear foot eversion may kind of create a different kind of stress on that Achilles tendon. That's right. More of a twisting kind of motion through the Achilles tendon. So I think all of that needs to be kind of looked at and they can't be, I don't think we can make a blanket statement for, for, for everyone. I think it's got to be more individualized with your approach as to how you want to minimize the, the stresses. You know, again, I think a heel lift can be helpful in certain cases, uh, high, like you talked about a, a higher heel drop shoe, or even maybe an orthotic with a little bit of a lift built in or just a lift, you know, all of those are, can be appropriate. Um, yeah. but, um, but I tend not to worry too much about that unless something's really kind of glaring. I just, and I try not to make too many early on in this process. I try not to make too many recommendations to change their gait. Um, and I do the same thing with my, with my ACLs. Um, you know, for the first couple of times, I just want them to run what's comfortable for them, get used to the act of running as opposed to throwing so many cues at them initially. Right. So just get used to, um, and I won't do a gate, a gate, um, a video analysis of them for their first couple of times on any type of return to run program here, because again, it's it, for me, 
there's more important things that I'm worried about than than truly what their form looks like in that situation. I want I want to make sure that they're they're confident and they're not favoring it, so to speak. You know, whether they're a rear foot striker or a four foot striker, and maybe they could be more efficient. That's that's that can come later on. I just want to make sure that they are they are pain free, not favoring it or limping, and um, and and try to minimize the the uh, the stress on that tissue as best I can. Yeah, and Scott and I have in teaching courses, we've gone back and forth on this. I think we had almost an hour discussion about this one time because I I am doing gait analysis much earlier on, and I'm focusing on cues. I think we agree in the most part about um, keeping it simple and mm-hmm. just focusing on – I think that's where we really agree on it about – uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect form. Uh, it, it is by no means are we trying to do the same level of gait retraining that we would maybe do for somebody right. that's um, not operative or something like, you know, there, there's different goals for the gait analysis, but I'm much more likely to put somebody a gait analysis the first time that they run and start to give them proprioception. Because in my mind, I think what a lot of these injuries lack is proprioception of what they're doing and giving them awareness. And now it's different because I have the ability to give a live 3D view of what their knee is doing uh, post-op ACL right away. And they can see the difference. And it's not that I'm cueing them a ton. I'm just like, hey, see the red and the blue, like the red is your involved, the the blue is your uninvolved. Like try to improve these just a little, like how does that feel if you do that? And I almost use it more as a diagnostic tool to say, oh, hey, they're, they're still not very confident in going into weight-bearing knee flexion and I should get them back uh, and check how they do on a lateral step down or a loading progression like Scott was talking about earlier. So um, I, we're different but similar in like don't – like I think what we would both agree on is don't overcomplicate it and just let them kind of adjust. But what you can – I think my main goals are more around proprioception and getting them to be aware of what they're doing. Um is really my prime goal with this. And then in this specific instance, also understanding how, yes, if they are having pain or an issue with this, you should understand that a treadmill does put more stress on the posterior chain and that it is going to make them more likely to land in a four foot position. And that's why we should understand the differences of treadmill versus overground running um, and be aware of those things. But the goal early on is just making sure that they're feeling uh, competent and confident in it there. And then you don't have to do everything at once. I think Scott and I are, are in agreement with that. Um, I just like to give them a little bit more proprioceptive feedback as much as I can, but I have that at my disposal, which is different. Yeah. I, I very rarely. And so if, so if, a, if an Achilles repair that I'm seeing, you know, jumps on the treadmill right off the bat, they're, they're, they're running on their toes. Um, yeah which is very rare to have happen, right? Mm-hmm. They're not going to, that's not the way they're going. They're going to be very, very, I gotta like it. Gonna yeah. go the other way. But if for, for, if for this case they did, that may be somebody that I jump in a lot quicker and say, Hey, you know, back off the, back off the forefoot quite as much, you know, maybe try to land a little bit more, a little bit more natural through your foot and those type of things. But, but yeah. it, it usually doesn't skew that way. Yeah. It's normally like relax the foot, you know, try to like give them some feedback when they look tense and be like, hey, you're like, you're really upright or you're really leaning forward or like some of those things. And that's where like the gate categories sometimes come in because we know overstriding puts a lot of braking forces on it too, right? So just teaching them some basic cues and some proprioception and getting them in a wall drill or teaching them some margin drills, just like basic general stuff is really good, but you're not going to hammer it and try to make them perfect perfect with the form early on but uh, like we've mentioned like small gains make a big difference with with a lot of this early on so um all right last thing i'm gonna talk about here just quickly because i mean we could do a whole course on this right this could be a weekend long course but we're we're trying to give some quick tips here um jumping right Mm -hmm. like uh, when we talk about running we have in our level two course, we have our loading levels progression, and we just talk about how essential it is that we are developing that springiness back. We measure with the with a 3D, we're looking at stiffness and we're looking at some of those variables. And I do see a lot of stiffness changes with, with this population as well. Um, but like what uh, what's your thoughts on, on jumping, of timing? Like is that 
before running? Because we talked a little bit about that, about doing that before running. Um, what do we want to get them up to? Uh, you know, where does jumping fall into it for your patients? Um, I, I use it early and often and I yep. do it, um, you know, when we start talking running, I think we need to really talk about, you know, speed. So running is different mm -hmm. than sprinting and the forces and the or amount of work that the, uh, the posterior calf complex slash Achilles needs yep. to do is, is definitely greater in the faster speeds. Um, but yes, I, I do. I like to make sure that they can handle load as well as, you know, absorb force and, and return the force back um, adequately before I get them to make that progression to running or jogging even. So, yeah, um, it, it's just like anything else. It's it's part of the progression, right? It's like yeah. you've got to build up strength. You've got to build. And that's to me, that's the most important thing. You know, I think if you can get a good, adequate strength base, everything else kind of falls very nicely into place. Mm -hmm. Their ability to load and explode is better. Um, their, their overall, um, tolerance for activities is better. Um, yeah. So if you can get them stronger, um, and, and the, the explosiveness and the, and the elasticity components will, will, will likely follow. And this is where I do really like the loading levels assessment because it does really go through some of those basics with it there, the ability to load throughout there. I think it is something that really it's more of a prescriptive type thing of like, what type of exercises should you start this person with? Like, I love a depth squad. And I think that that's something that you can start people early on because you're not really getting that true plyometric where you're leaving the ground and getting a high rate of force, but you're, you're, you're just teaching rate of force production and you're teaching how to be aware of your posture when you're doing those things. And I think having some guidelines of not just saying, oh, hey, you're 10 weeks now, so we should start doing these exercises, but actually looking and understanding, okay, you can do a lateral step down. Great, that looked good. All right, now we're gonna have you jump over a hurdle. Ooh, that didn't look good. Okay, we're still in bilateral activities here and we need to get you confident with some of these things and before we progress on to anything unilaterally there. And having some way to just be able to say, hey, this is about the level of exercise that you should be doing now. I think that gives the patient confidence. I think it gives you confidence. And obviously you have to match it up with surgical healing timeframes. Um, but I think having a guide like that does make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then again, you know, running, most, most running is, is straight plane, but you know, with, if we're talking about the athletic population after Achilles, we got to make sure that they can cut and change and, 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 you know, put different type of forces through the Achilles. It's not just, you know, sagittal plane strut, straight front to back. It's 45, it's 35, it's 27 degree angle push-offs, Right. So yeah. I think all of that is part, part and parcel to train as well. And, and, um, how they tolerate, you know, landing with a perturbation, you know, uh, it, it, you know, my gymnasts are, are good examples of that. They never, you know, when they're tumbling, they never always land perfectly. When you're on a beam, it's a hard surface. So you got to make sure that when you're doing those type of things, your tissue can handle it and, uh, and you can be explosive in, in different planes of movement. So yeah. um, that's a, just something to consider. I know it's not necessarily for our, for our running population, which is more usually straight plane type of stuff. Um, it's part of the, it's part of the equation as well. Yeah, but running, we might run in a straight plane, but all the other planes are pulling on us. So we have to avoid some of those motions, right? So even though running is, is an emotion, you're avoiding falling over to the side and you're avoiding twisting inward. So um, training all of those for runners, for any athlete, uh, you know, almost all sports involve running. So I think that uh -huh. that's an important concept too. Agreed. So um, yeah, well, Scott, thank you for sharing here. I think it's it's good just to hear from somebody that's seeing so many of these because I don't think the typical – the typical person, unless you're working directly with a physician that does a lot of these repairs, the typical rehabilitation specialist is not going to have this amount of experience with it. And it's just always good to learn, kind of accelerate your expertise a little bit and learn from things that so from somebody that's seen it. So appreciate you. That, oh, you're, you're welcome. And full disclosure, you're not going to see a lot of these Achilles repairs in your distance running population. You're not. Yeah. You're going to see it more in your sprinters and hurdlers. Like I said, I was seeing, mm -hmm. you know, two to uh, track and field athletes with this problem recently. Um, and um, it's not something that you see with your, with your 
recreational jogger or even your competitive 5k runner it's it's going to be more on the explosive 100 200s 400s maybe even 800 type of runners that you're going to see these with you're going to see it in your triple jumpers you're going to see it in your gymnasts you're going to see it in your high jumpers you're going to see it in your basketball players you're going to see it in your volleyball players you're going to see it in your soccer players you know those are the type of people primarily you're going to see it with your football players obviously aaron Rodgers. um but uh (laughs) But, uh, but yeah, but again, it is something that you will see if you work with runners. Um, it's just the, the force that usually kind of dictates this a lot of times. Not all the time, but a lot of times. If your distance runners did this, it's probably because they were like on a, you know, a rec softball or volleyball team or something for work. And, and they, or they maybe a trail runner. To be honest with you, you can see it in a trail runner who steps funny yeah. on a route. Like a, or steps yeah. off a curb, misses a curve, a distance runner that maybe takes a funny step. That's where you're going to see it. Yeah. That's where yeah. you're going to see it. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully you'll see it. But like I said at the beginning, hopefully you'll never experience it. Uh, even though it sounds like not a scary rehab, it's still something uh, you don't want to go through. So um, thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you have happy and healthy running. And make sure you subscribe and check out the Run DNA newsletter. Subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for listening today. Like what you hear? Leave a review of the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps runners and running specialists through education and technology to identify each runner's unique injury profile to avoid setbacks and maximize results. The Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. The Run DNA podcast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals before making healthcare decisions. Find us online at rundna.com.